I was born in Lithuania in a little country and uh, my life was quite normal before the war. Here's the map of Europe as occupied by Germany during the war, 1941-45, 1939-45. And I was born over here in Lithuania. Anybody here from Lithuania? Any kids? Anybody? No. Okay. It happens sometimes. It's a very small country. Two and a half million people used to be. And uh, my life, ah, that, is that good? You won't yeah. fall asleep? Okay. <laughs> and uh, my country was occupied by Germany in 1941. Until then, I had a normal life. This is my mother and me at age nine. This is me at age 13 with my new uniform ready to go to high school. And you know, I never used that uniform. Never used it. Never got it. Because the war broke out. It became a totally different world for me. I was born in a Jewish family. My parents were Jews. And uh, in Lithuania, there were a lot of Jews living. And uh, our life was normal. I went to school, like you do. I uh, liked science and mathematics. But I also enjoyed history and reading. I used to read a lot as a kid. And uh, I built model airplanes. Anybody still doing it today? Model airplanes? No, if not, you anyway, you buy it in the store and you put it together, right? A bit of plastic. But I used to build it out of balsa wood by myself. It took many, many hours. And I loved to fly airplanes. I had dreams. I wanted to be an engineer one day, and I wanted to be a pilot. Those were my two things in my head. And my life totally changed at the moment when the war broke out. My father worked in a bank. He immediately lost his job. He was a bookkeeper there. My mother was a nurse, and our life changed totally in 1941 when the German army, without declaring war, marched into Lithuania and into Poland, attacking the Soviet Union, Russia. Tanks were in the street within a day, small country, and immediately there were Nazi people fascists who were willing to rob and kill Jews, because here was their chance. There was no police protecting us. The Jews were the open market. Anybody could come and rob us and kill us, and many did. Soon after, the German management took over the country. For a little while, the Lithuanian local right-wingers created a government of their own for five weeks. And during those five weeks, they passed vicious programs against the Jews, specifically. However, the Nazis took over. And when I say Nazi, I'm talking about the National Socialist Party of Germany, Hitler's party, OK? And the Nazis were ruling Germany. So the Nazi regime took over Lithuania took charge of the situation, and they soon announced that we had to move out of our homes and move into a ghetto. Before that, they made us walk in the gutter, not on the sidewalk. We had to wear a yellow Star of David, front and back, so people should know this is a Jew walking there. You can beat him up. You can take away from him. Not allowed to go out after certain hours. Not allowed to go to certain stores. It became very miserable and threatening a life. And soon they announced they are putting us in a ghetto. They took an old part of town, surrounded it with barbed wire, put soldiers all around. Everyone who wasn't Jewish had to move out. And we had to move in. The word ghetto, by the way, comes from medieval Europe. It comes from Venice, when in the 15th century they announced that the Jews can't live in the city with the Christians, that they have to live on one island which used to be an iron foundry. And an iron foundry was called in medieval Italian a ghetto. So this became the ghetto of the Jews, a place where the Jews lived. The Nazis resurrected that word and uh, said they are creating a ghetto for Jews. 28,000 of us moved into the ghetto. And we didn't know what would happen. What would they do? Though the first thing they announced is, you all have to go to work, slave labor. You go wherever we send you, under God, and do whatever we tell you, and you don't get paid. 
you must be satisfied that we are sending food into the ghetto so that you can eat. So life settled down, you had to go to work from the age of 15, but very soon they came into the ghetto, the officers and the soldiers, and they went door to door, demanding that we hand over all our valuables, gold, silver, um, cameras, musical instruments, first had to be handed over. And always under the threat of death. If you hide something, not only will we kill you, we will kill the whole, all the families that live in this house. We lived in very crowded conditions, there were many people. My parents and I, I, have no, I was an only child, uh, we had a room and we had to share it with one other stranger. So we gave it up, we gave up. Uh, wedding rings had to be taken off, everything given away. The interesting thing is, we got a receipt. They wrote down on a piece of paper, the Germans are very orderly people, everything is written down. They wrote down our name on the top of the form and filled in one, two, three, four, whatever we gave up. Two wedding rings, uh, three whatever, two silver uh, candle holders and uh, a fur. We got a copy of that receipt. It's like a robber comes into your house, steals your television and gives you a receipt. It's the same thing. <laughs> Can you imagine? Why am I telling you about the receipt? I want you to know that when you hear later in life about people who say that the Holocaust is not true, that it didn't happen, that it wasn't like that, that Jews made it up, please, we have documentation of everything. Today in Bad Arolsen in Germany, a town in Germany, they have a collection of 30 million documents about the Holocaust which has been collected from all over Germany and put in one place. It was under the control of the Red Cross for 65 years, and recently, in the last two years, they've started to open it up. Until then, they didn't show it to anyone. And people can find there all kinds of records, and they have found to connect families where people didn't know that their brother or sister survived. They find them that they are in another country. All the documents are there. The Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews in Europe, is the best recorded event in history. There is 30 million documents. There are something like 28 kilometers of shelves holding those documents. So, you will know when you hear Holocaust the deniers who say it didn't happen, it isn't true, and there is a lot of it going around now, and when we are dead, the last survivors, you must remember it is all documented. You can find documentation for everything. If you went in Bad Arlson, you'll probably find my receipt, what my family got, gave up at the time in 1941. Soon after came another rule. You must hand over all your books. Now, gold and silver, we didn't have much. <laughs> we were not a wealthy family. We lived in a rented apartment in the city. But books, we had a lot of books. My father loved books. He collected books all his life. We had a huge library. I had a library of my own already by the time I was 13. Um, he brought all the books to the, to the ghetto. My mother wanted to take other things. We couldn't bring everything, but he brought all the books, the cartons. We carried the heavy cartons of books into the ghetto, and we deposited them on the side on the wall. They were still lying there. So my father was very upset that he has to give up his books. He went to his collection, he pulled out some less important books, put them on a wheelbarrow, and he and I went to deliver the books to the collection center. When we arrived, the collection center was a small synagogue. And we walked in to an amazing sight. There was a mountain of books from the floor all the way to the balcony on top where the women used to sit. A mountain of books, imagine between here and the wall there, packed with books, and people are coming, climbing over books and throwing more books down. A mess. My father looked around and he says to me, Ellie, you notice? Know with the books they trust us. There, there are no guards here, no German soldiers. And then he bends down and he picks up a red, beautifully bound volume and there were six others lying on the floor. And he says, look at this Pushkin. 
the collection, the whole collection of Pushkin. Pushkin is the greatest Russian poet. He died in 1838, and in 1938, uh, he died actually at the age of 38. He was very young. He died because um, he accused the son of the French ambassador in being interested in his wife. And he called him for a duel. You know, a duel with pistols, they were shooting at each other. Now, Pushkin was a fantastic poet, but a lousy shot. The other guy killed him. <laughs> so Pushkin died in 1838, and in 1938, they issued all the volume that everything Pushkin had written in his short life. An amazing collection. And my father said, I always wanted to buy it, but I couldn't afford it. It was so expensive. You know what, Ellie? He said, take out our books and put in the Pushkin in our wheelbarrow. Then he went further, and he bent down and picked up two volumes, Gretz, Geschichte der Juden, History of the Jews, a great a German um, historian who wrote the history of the Jews, a famous set of two volumes. He says, that's beautiful, but put it in the wheelbarrow. He went further, he found German classics, Russian classics. We loaded up this big wheelbarrow, it was so heavy, with a lot of books, we covered it with a newspaper, and we went home. And we did it seven times. <laughs> we went back, stealing more books, bringing, going empty and coming back full. We collected a fantastic library in several languages. I should explain, I grew up as a kid with Yiddish in my mouth. Yiddish is a Germanic language that the Jews brought when traveling a thousand years ago from Eastern Europe towards Poland, Russia, Lithuania. They took the German language with them, but they wrote it with Hebrew letters from right to left. English has it wrong, it goes the other way. <laughs> um, all, all Eastern languages, most Eastern languages, uh, Arabic, uh, Farsi, and so on, are written from right to left. Do I have competition here? <laughs> so, I grew up speaking Yiddish to my parents, which all the Jews of Eastern Europe spoke. But my father and my mother, when they wanted to communicate that I shouldn't understand, which parents do, right? They spoke Russian to each other. Because they grew up in Russian language. They, they, Lithuania had been occupied by Russia for 150 years before the First World War. So their schools were Russian, and they learned Russian very well. Now, how long do you think it took me to learn Russian? No time at all. It took them a long time to catch on that I understand everything they are saying. <laughs> <laughs> so I learned Russian. When I went downstairs to play with the kids in the street, I spoke Lithuanian, a language totally different from Russian. Lithuania is a, the Lithuanian language is one of the oldest in Europe. It is older than Latin. It came directly from the Himalayas, from Sanskrit. Sanskrit is the original language from which most of our languages descended. But Lithuanian is early Sanskrit because Several thousand years before, the Lithuanian tribes traveled from the Himalayas all the way to the Baltic Sea, and they settled there. So the Lithuanian language is quite unique. Nothing else in Europe is similar to it. It's a totally different language. Would you like to hear a sound of it? Yeah. It's a little poem by Myronis, a well-known Lithuanian poet, about the old great leaders who are lying in the sand and dreaming of old times while their graves are covered with moss, something like that. So Lithuanian is a totally different language from Russian. And then I knew German because we had German neighbors. We were friends with Germans. They used to come to the house, and I learned it at school. So I had um, Yiddish, Russian, German, Lithuanian, and a little Hebrew. When I was five years old, I had five languages spinning in my head because the Jews pray in Hebrew. All our prayers are in Hebrew. So you have to know a bit of it. So I had four and a half languages. I don't know Hebrew well. 
I can read it, but I don't always understand what they say. Now, we stayed in, so we brought all those books home, and my mother said to my father, she was furious, she said, you, what are you doing? You, you are bringing more books? She said, you want to, I know what you want. You want them to come and shoot us, kill us here uh, in our house. No, no, said my father, don't worry, I'm not keeping them in the house. All the books, there's no place here anyway. We are taking all the books up early, climb up the ladder in the shed outside, and put it above the boards, above the rafters of our boards, put them there. If anybody finds them, not ours, we don't know who it belongs to. So uh, I did that. And I, all the books, all our books are old books and the new library, which was fantastic. He had the best. Put it up there. I laid out bricks with boards. I made bookshelves. I sorted them out. I didn't have to go to work. I was 13 year old. Everybody from the age of 15 had to go to slave labor. <coughs> 28,000 people were in the ghetto. It was a town. I went upstairs and I read. I had no schooling. There was no schooling for me. I never went to high school. And uh, I read. I taught myself Russian really well. I loved Pushkin. I read Tolstoy. I read War and Peace, a huge book. I, I read Anna Karenina, the classics of Russian literature. I read Lermontov. I read the poets, the other poets. I read a mass of Russian. And I taught myself Russian really well. Until then, I knew it more or less. But now I learned the literary language of Russian. It was difficult, but I loved it. I came to love the Russian language. I read the German classics, Goethe and Schiller and Heine. Heinrich Heine is one of the greatest German poets. He was a Jew. He converted in later in life. He called it the ticket, the entry ticket to European culture to be converted because he was limited as a Jew of uh, living freely and participating in university life and so on. And he's one of the greatest poets of Germany. <laughs> but the Germans didn't want to recognize the Jew as a poet. So during the war, <clears throat> they had some poems that they could not eliminate from the German language, that they could not not teach, not have in the schools. So they wrote Poet Unknown. <laughs> but he's well known. So I read the German classics, Goethe and Schiller and Heine, and the modern poets I like particularly, Hauptmann and others. Uh, that was my education. I read the German, the French literature in translation, mostly in German. Uh, I, read, I read a lot. I, uh, it's amazing when I think back now how much I had absorbed in that little time that I had there, sitting up on the roof under, I had to lift out the tile to let the sun come in because there was no electricity. That was what I did. I sat there reading. Adults went to work every morning. They had to gather up in front of the gate and they were sorted in groups and taken to wherever they took them. Digging ditches, building an airport, working in hospitals, cleaning the floors, digging whatever. I didn't have to go. And then one day they announced in October 1941. We got into the ghetto by July, closed in August. In October, they announced nobody goes to work tomorrow, the 28th of October, everybody has to gather in a big open field inside the ghetto. 28,000 people gather. Threat of death. If you stay home and we come in, we will kill you. Everybody will be killed who is there. Sick people, we don't care. Take them out to the field and leave the doors open. So we all gathered in that big open field. And on top of the field stood a man with white gloves in the uniform of the SS, SS Schutzstaffel, Hitler's own army, the volunteer army, the worst. They were the really dedicated Nazis. And he stood there and everyone had to walk past him in families. 28,000 people took a whole day. And he asked questions. Where do you work? I work at the airport. And who is that? That's my wife. She works in the hospital downtown there where she's doing whatever. And this is my son. He's 13. Or whatever. He's my mother. She doesn't have to go. OK, you go to the right. And another family, you go to the left. Sometimes he split the family. It took one half, one way, one way. Took a whole day. We went by. He sent us back into the ghetto. 
but 10,000 people were gathered, not allowed to go back in the ghetto, outside the fence, they were put there, and under guard, they stayed the whole night, it was a cold night, outside. Next morning, we saw a large mass of people slowly marching up the hill, past the ghetto, towards the ninth fort. Dogs were barking, soldiers were shouting, and this mass of people carrying little suitcases, whatever they had with them, we always had something in case they deport us, they take us away. And the mass of people, 10,000 people, marched up the hill towards the ninth fort. The ninth fort was a fortified military compound from the First World War. And there, the next morning, on the 29th of October, 1941, 10,000 men, women, and children were murdered with machine guns in one day, and their bodies thrown in long trenches that were dug beforehand by Russian prisoners. How do we know that 10,000 were killed there? Who counted them? How do we know? Who was that man that stood in front of us and sorted us out? That man is well known to Canadians because he was a Canadian citizen after the war. From 1950 to 1982, 32 years, that mass murderer lived in Canada amongst us. Okay? He came here in 1950, they asked him, what did you do? He said, I was a police officer, nobody asked him any questions. Germany was looking for him. They asked the international police to find him. Canadian RCMP took 32 years to find him. You know why? Because the Prime Minister of Canada said at the time, I don't want to bring the European arguments and fights to Canada. Mr. Trudeau said, don't do it. So they didn't find him. I don't know why it took 32 years, because he was in the phone book in Toronto under his own name. Can you believe it? It took them 32 years to find him. Yeah. He was charged with mass murder. And how do we know that 10,000 people were killed? Because we have a document. This is part of a document translated from German. The Jäger report. Jäger was the guy that signed the report. Standartenführer. He was a very high officer in the SS. You see, SS Standartenführer. That is the army of Hitler's own army. He didn't trust his whole own army. He, tried, he wanted his own army to have. He didn't trust the German army. So he had SS created. These were people, they all had um, in, on, inside of their arm, they had a tattoo, SS. That's how we used to recognize them later, to look under their arm and see if they had the SS. They couldn't take it out. And here he writes, Secret state document, he reports, he was Einsatzkommando 3. You will hear the word Einsatzkommando. This was a special group of people, volunteer soldiers, who were invited to come and kill people face to face. Not everybody wanted to do it, and those who couldn't, well, said, it's okay, you, you can go, you don't have to do it. But these were volunteers. And they were sent all around Russia and Lithuania, and this was number three commanders, there were many of them, and they were straight killers. They had to kill. And he describes here the summary executions between July and December 1941. And he says 192 executions are listed on the following pages, showing how many men, Jewish women, and children were murdered in each. Total number 137,386. Before December 1941, 80% of the Jews of Lithuania had been killed. They were not sent to Auschwitz. They were not sent to other places. They were killed on their own soil. And an excerpt in 29th of October, that is what I'm telling you about, in Kovno, our city, the capital, 9th Fort, 2,007 Jewish men, 2,920 women, and 4,373 Jewish children, 9,200 total, removal from the ghetto of surplus Jews. We were surplus. Signed, Jäger. We have the report. Unlike genocides, the word genocide was established after the Second World War in connection with the Holocaust. 
but it describes the killing of a whole people as opposed to murder of a small group, killing of a whole nation, trying to kill a whole nation, is called genocide. It comes from two words, a Latin word, genos, which means tribe of nation, and sidere in Greek, to kill, genocide, to kill a whole nation. I will speak about genocide later. This is the best recorded genocide in history. When the Turks killed a million Armenians in the most vicious manner by killing them with knives and throwing them down wells and so on, they are still denying it to this day in Turkey because there are no documents. When Rwanda killed a million people recently, there are no documents. The reports are, we don't know exactly how many were killed. But the Holocaust, we know pretty close because the Germans kept wonderful records. They keep records of everything. I remained in the ghetto. At first, we didn't know what happened to those 10,000. Later, we heard about it in December. Some people escaped from there uh, who were working there, burning the bodies, because after they threw them in the graves and buried them, they unburied them and burned them so that there should be left no remains. And in, uh, at Christmas time, 1942, actually a year, a year and a half later, um, some people escaped from there and uh, came back to the ghetto and told us what they saw. And that man, that man Rauka, who lived here, he came to Canada, he bought himself a motel in Huntsville, he had a good time, he lived quietly, he didn't talk to too many people, they said. Then he retired, he sold the motel, he moved into Toronto and was my neighbor. He lived uh, on uh, York Mills Bayview in that area, he was two streets away from me. Finally, they found him. What do you do with him? He's a Canadian citizen, and Germany wants him extradited. We have never sent a Canadian citizen to stand trial in another country. We don't do that. It's almost against the Constitution. So we had a court case. A big court case came up. And the judge decided that this man must stand trial in Germany, because they have all the facts there. So they sent him back to Germany. He never stood for trial. He died before the trial came up. He was an old man. I want you to know that many hundreds of war criminals lived and are living in Canada. We were one of the more welcoming countries for them. Canada and South America, Argentina particularly. As a matter of fact, many of them helped to escape from Europe uh, by the Vatican, I must tell you, by the Catholic Church. Although the Vatican also saved Jews. In Italy, there is a very good record of saving Jews. But after the war, they were helped to get out. Um, what happened in the ghetto? I was a kid, as I say, I was reading upstairs. Then the el elders of the ghetto decided they should form a school. They asked for permission from the Nazis to form a school and to, um, to teach the kids from 12 to 15 that they could learn a trade, that they could be useful later. So the Germans said, sure, go ahead. So they built a school, a primitive school, but a school. And I joined. I joined the metalwork locksmithing school. I learned how locks work, uh, how to make keys, how to open doors without a key. I never used it for bad purposes, I must tell you. But uh, I became a locksmith, and I became a toolmaker. I learned how to work a lathe, I learned blacksmithing, I learned all the trades with metal. We also had a woodworking shop for learning wood, which I didn't do, and we had a bricklaying shop, and the girls sewing. <coughs> so I joined the school, and I found it very interesting. I loved it. It was so interesting to learn to work metal really well, particularly handwork, filing and drilling and measuring precisely. I became a toolmaker. And after a time, I was a good student. I was appointed assistant instructor, and a bit later, full instructor. By the time I was 15 and a half year old, I had two classes, morning and afternoon, of 28 kids each time. Now recently, here from Canada, my wife and I went to Washington, and we visited the Holocaust Museum. Anybody been there? Washington Museum, Holocaust. Yeah. 
Well, you know what a fantastic institution it is, huh? It's incredible. And I was standing upstairs watching one screen that was showing slides of the Kovno Ghetto, the place where I come from. And I said to my wife, I said, oh, that's, that's what this place was. And I recognized that place. That was where the, the management of the ghetto was and so on. And here are people dragging their goods into the ghetto and so on. And then comes up a picture. I said, eh, that's my school. That's where I worked. And the next picture, it's a lathe. I used to, I built that lathe. And I, I built it from pieces. Uh, I put it together and then I taught on that lathe. And the third picture, I said, that's me. I recognize myself. Here I am. That guy with the black hair, make no mistake. That's me. <laughs> and here are the kids around me. A very brave guy, an engineer in the ghetto, kept his Leica camera. He didn't give it up. If they caught him, he would have been hanged. Somebody did something wrong. They hanged him in the ghetto, and we had to come and watch. Everybody had to come and watch a man being hanged. It's a horrible experience. And here we are all wearing the yellow Star of David on our chest and also on our backs, you see. So here I am teaching the kids metal. I remember he came in, he opened his jacket, and there was a camera. And I said, oh my god. He said, don't look at me. In case they find the picture, you shouldn't know that I've taken the picture. You look down. And that's why we are all looking down. We are not looking at the camera. He took a picture and he disappeared. This brave guy took thousands of pictures in Ghetto Kovna. He buried them, he developed them, because he worked as a slave laborer in an x-ray department in the city. So he was able to develop his films. So he developed the films, put them in cassettes, put them in a metal box, and buried them in the ground in several places. And then he escaped from the ghetto after three years. Just before they liquidated the ghetto, he escaped, and he came back as soon as the Russians marched in two weeks later. He came in and he dug up his films and he took them out of the country. It's a long story how they got there, but eventually they got to the Holocaust Museum in Washington and that's what we were watching. So I got the copy of my picture and I was so happy to have it and everybody saw around me there because I was with a group of people from Toronto and the story got out to the Star newspaper here and the star came to interview me about that picture and the stories. I told my whole story and I had a whole page in the star. And two weeks later, the star called me and said, somebody recognized you in that picture. I said, who? He said, I, I, we don't know, somebody in Israel. In Israel. Turns out, there was a teacher from Israel who was visiting Toronto on that day, saw the article, remembered he has a friend from Kovno, from the ghetto, so he took the article to him. And it was this fellow, this guy, who recognized, he said, that's me, and that's Ellie Gotts. So what do you know? I went to Israel to find him, and here he is sitting next to me, having lunch, dinner with me, uh, lunch. And he brought two other students of mine. I didn't know they survived. I had no idea they were alive. And it was wonderful. And he said to me, Ellie, you taught me well. I built a factory here in Israel. I build machines which I export all over the world, binding machines for wire we build. I said, what about the other two guys? They said, no, we are not. Uh, this one is a dental technician. This one was planting trees and writing books. He's a writer. And he complained. Ellie he says, you never liked my work. You were not happy with me. I said, because you are a writer. You are not a locksmith. <laughs> so teach us. 20 years from now, one of those kids is going to come and complain about you. You can be sure of that. Don't do it. <laughs> I had a wonderful time in Israel. It was amazing. I met another one in Jerusalem who was also who has written a great book. He was hidden by his mother. She took him across the river. He calls the book Over the River. Um, and hid him with the Lithuanian family. And she disappeared, never came back. So he remained uh, a total orphan. His father was killed before, but uh, he wrote a very fine book. So there we are, in the ghetto. Long time went past. I'll tell you one more story from the ghetto that I have time for. And I had a little cousin. She was born just before the war. She was a year and a half old in the ghetto. A lovely little girl. Nobody had time for her. Her father had to go to slave labor every day, a whole day. He was slaving and coming back very tired. 
her, her mother had to cook for 12 people. I looked after the child. I used to take her for walks and tell her stories and entertain her and feed her and put her to sleep. And I loved that little girl. She became my first baby. I was 15, I had a girl of my own. I had a child of my own. It was like that. It was my baby. I loved her. She clung to me and I clung to her. But my uncle and aunt felt this is not a good place for a child. Who knows what they will do with us next? So he wrote to a friend of his, a Catholic in the city, a fine man, a writer, a translator from the Italian into Lithuanian, a cultured man, and he wrote, would you take my child? And an answer came back from his wife, and she said, I don't know where my husband is. The Russians arrested him just before the Germans came, because Lithuania was occupied for one year before the German attack by the Russians. We were part of the Soviet Union for a whole year. And he was a Lithuanian nationalist. So he wrote letters to the paper that Lithuania should be free, should not be part of Russia. They arrested him, and they shot him. They took him away. They killed him. She didn't know that, but we know now. So she said, how can I meet you? I am prepared to take the child. I have no children of my own. I'll take your child. Um, let, let's talk. So my uncle told her where he worked in daytime. He used to go under guard to a factory. So she came there, and noontime he snuck out, and he met her, and he spoke to her. And he said, listen, I've got some jewelry, and I've got some money I want to give you for the upkeep of the child. I will not take anything from you, she said. Only the child, only the child, nothing. And if you and your wife don't survive, you must agree that I will not give her up to anybody that is a relative of yours. Only you or your wife can get her back. My uncle agreed. An arrangement was made. One morning, how do you get the child out of the ghetto? We are surrounded with barbed wire and with, with guards. So one morning, my mother gave the child a very strong injection. My mother worked as a nurse, a surgical sister in the hospital. Um, gave her a strong injection, knocked her out completely. They put her in a duffel bag. Uncle put it on his shoulders and went out to work. Under guard, they used to stop under a bunch of trees because it was a long way to walk for a rest. They stopped. He took off the bag with his daughter, left it behind the tree, and went off to work. He turned back and he saw a man came, grabbed the bag as arranged. We got a message. The goods have arrived. The child was safe. But I fell into a depression. I wasn't thinking how my uncle and aunt suffered not having their child there. I missed my little girl. And I was thinking all the time how she woke up amongst strangers that she has never seen who speak a language she doesn't understand. They spoke Lithuanian, she speaks Yiddish. What a pain for a child to go through to discover she is not with the people she has known all her life, which is a year and a half. I couldn't get it out of my mind. I was walking around in a deep depression. I now understand it was a deep depression for three months. But then one day, a bunch of trucks came into the sit into the ghetto, buses actually, with the white windows painted over white and music blaring, jolly music on from loudspeakers on top. And soldiers poured out of the buses and went hunting for children. <coughs> they were hunting for kids while the adults were out working. They were hunting for their kids. Anything from babies stolen from mothers' arms, or the mothers went with the children on the truck, to kids up to the age of about 10 or 11. My parents hid me. I was 15, but I, I don't know why they, well, they, they were afraid. They didn't know whom they would take. So they took me down into the basement of the hospital where both my parents worked. And they put me in the third basement behind the board in a smelly place. And I stayed there for about 10 hours till they came to get me out. Over 3,000 children and some mothers and parents were taken away and killed, murdered the same day. All kinds of other murders took place, and I haven't got time either to list them or to tell you about them. Out of, of 20, 28,000 people, 10,000 we lost at the beginning, leaving 18,000. And three years later, we had 8,000 left in the ghetto. 
and what will happen with us, because we could hear the Russian front was near. As you saw from the map, that the Germans were all the way at the borders of Moscow and Leningrad, and now the Russian army, after three years, defeated them and drove them back into Lithuania and into Poland. Very soon the Russian army will be here. But will we be free? Will they let us live? We were sure they may not want to. And one day they announced, we are liquidating the ghetto. That was a terrifying sound, liquidating the ghetto. What does it mean, liquidate? We are taking you for work somewhere else. We didn't believe it. Many, several thousand people didn't believe it. <coughs> Tried to hide. Quite impromptu, our family decided we are not going. We are not going to be killed up there on the ninth fort. In fact, you know, I lived three years in the ghetto after the story with the ninth fort became known, two years, with a constant fear in the back of my mind of being killed, shot, but not killed, and being thrown in a trench on top of dead bodies and dead bodies above me. I had this, this nightmare throughout the ghetto time, I remember. It was always in the back of my mind. One time I was thinking of trying to join the partisans, but my, which were fighting against the Germans outside the ghetto. There was a big resistance, by the way. But my parents said, you are too young, you can't go. I was 15, I was 16. But I was teaching class. And now they are going to liquidate the ghetto. So my parents and I, we went down with my family, my three uncles, my aunt, and two friends. We went down into the house in the basement. We found an empty room. We covered the door with a cupboard, so it shouldn't be obvious there's a door there. We went inside and we decided if they find us, if they start to move the cupboard, we are committing suicide, all of us. My mother, being the nurse, got the job to prepare for suicide. And here's what she did. She laid out on a white, on a tray, a white cloth with syringes on it. She had a number of syringes filled with a brown medicine. It was a heart drug. And the idea was to inject an excessive dose of this very strong heart drug, which saves the heart when it starts to fail. But if you get an excessive dose, it accelerates the heart and you have a heart attack. The heart stops. And that was the idea, to stop the heart, create a heart attack. That was a theory anyway. We didn't test it. <laughs> we didn't test it, no. And next to each syringe, my mother had a bit of cotton wool, and she had a bottle of alcohol on the side. And I looked at it, and I said, Mother, this is the last injection. It doesn't have to be a clean one. You won't have time. <laughs> and we all laughed, yeah. We all laughed. It was funny. She, she was going to give us a clean last injection. Everybody laughed except my mother. She said, I've been doing this like that all my life. But she took away the cotton wool and the alcohol. And I was sitting there, I was 16 year old, and I was wondering, was my mother strong enough to do it to me? I knew she loved me. <laughs> I expected to be first, because I'm an only child. Only children always expect to be first. Who, are, who is our only children here? Yeah, we come first, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, we come first. <laughs> only children have this, you know, no competition for their parents' love. <laughs> we sat there for three days and nights. I was also wondering, is it hard to die of a heart attack? Doesn't the, heart, the brain go on when the heart stops? Good question. In fact, it goes on for 13 minutes. After the heart stops, we have 13 minutes before the brain runs out of oxygen and shuts down. Until then, it's very painful. Chest pain, arm pain. Um, we sat there for three days and nights. Nothing happened. On the fourth morning, we heard two soldiers coming down. With the butts of the rifles, they were hitting the wooden stairs. They came down, they walked past our room. They went to the end of the corridor of the passage. They found the, the coal shed. They kicked in the door. They saw nobody there. They went back. They looked in the room opposite the house. And one said to the other, and we heard it. They were right behind the cupboard, you know, outside. And one said to the other, there's nobody here. And they walked out. My mother was sitting with a syringe, and I had my arm bare. I expected to be first. Mm -hmm. 
We sat another two days or three days. I don't remember. It was so boring to sit in the semi-darkness there. We heard nothing. It was very quiet in the basement. There was no windows there even. So after a couple of days, we got tired of sitting there. We had food and water. We were okay. We went outside to have a look. Let's see. Maybe the Russian army is here. Perhaps we are free. No. The Nazis were still there. And our people were marching to a train. There was a train standing on a siding. And our people are just going to a train. Well, if they have a train, perhaps they didn't lie to us. They don't need a train to march us up the hill to the, to, and kill us there. So they are taking us somewhere. So perhaps there is hope. So we took our little luggage we always had ready and we went to a train. The train journey is a story that every survivor will tell you was a horrible experience. 200 people were crammed into a freight wagon so tight that there was no place for us to sit on the ground. We were lying on top of each other. People started to go crazy. People started to die. Because the train took off and it took uh, two nights and a day we traveled. And we arrived in Stutthof, a concentration camp in North Germany, near the Polish border. And there the doors finally opened. Everybody out of the train, push out the dead bodies before you leave. In five minutes they separated the men from the women. My mother and my aunt remained standing on the platform, my father and I back on the train. And the train took off, still without water, without food, with no facilities, nothing. It was just awful, the smell and the... I don't even want to think about it. And we traveled another day and the night and we arrived in the south of Germany, outside Munich, the capital of the Bavaria. And we were offloaded on a station outside Munich somewhere. And we were marched off half dead to an open field, surrounded with barbed wire, machine gun posts on the corners, and a gate with a big sign on the front, Concentration Camp Dachau, Camp Number One. Arbeit macht frei was written on top. Work sets you free. That was a slogan of all concentration camps. Work sets you free. We used to say, work sets you free to die, to go to heaven. We knew we were in a bad place. When we saw the name Dachau, we knew we were in a bad, bad place. Hitler established the concentration camp Dachau in 1933 when he came to power. And he locked up all his political enemies publishers and editors of newspapers, political leaders, communists, socialists, labor leaders, ministers of the church who opposed him, politicians who opposed him before from the Social Democratic Party or whatever party. They were locked up in concentration camps. But the first one was Dachau, an institution famous in Europe, terrified Europe with that name. And now we were in Dachau. But when we looked at what we saw, we couldn't believe that this was a camp of Dachau. By the way, this is my little cousin with her adopted mother. I forgot. I have the picture. This is a brave woman who took a fantastic chance because if they reported the neighbor said she's holding a Jewish child, she and her mother and the child would have been killed immediately. It happened many times. Many times. They were killed because a neighbor spoke up and told the Gestapo. So that's my view. This is what we saw. And we couldn't believe that this was Dachau. It looked such a miserable place, such little huts half buried in the ground. This is Dachau? It wasn't. This is a working camp, camp number one out of 11 camps that were built around a huge building site to build. Nothing to do with Dachau, except it was under the network of Dachau. They have just found, I read two days ago in the paper, that researchers who have been digging and digging how many concentration camps and centers were there in Germany and in all the occupied territories. You may have seen it in the paper, huh? 42, 420,000. 
they found a number far beyond what anybody believed was really true, was really before. But they now have the full numbers and details. So we were in this camp, one of those, there were several like that. You see the double fence here, double fence with barbed wire, electrified sometimes. I don't know if it always was, but it, it was electric. You could die if you touched the wire. And there was the machine gun posts on the corners, and these were the huts. And here's inside the hut, a picture inside the hut. Um, here's a, a prisoner sitting here, and another one is lying down there. Here's a striped uniform that we were wearing. 25 men slept on the left side and 25 men on the right. Water used to come in because this was below ground, so when it rained, water used to be here. We used to walk with our feet uh, over our feet and ankles in, in water. I spent three years in that hut. In three years, I never changed my clothes. In three years, I'm sorry, in 10 months, I didn't have a shower. We had no washing facilities in that camp, nothing. Plug, uh, they had taps outside, and they froze in winter. We were full of lice. The lice brought disease, and we were starved to death while working. And what were we doing? We were building a giant factory. The plan was, the Germans had a problem. They invented the first jet fighter plane. It could fly 200 kilometers an hour faster than anything the Allies had. The first jet. But they couldn't build them fast enough because the Allies were bombing their factories consistently. Every day they were bombing the Germany fantastically heavily. Millions of tons of bombs were dropped. So they couldn't build their airplanes. And Hitler said, if I could build 2,000 a month of these fighter planes, I could defeat the Allies. I could chew down every bomber out of the sky. So this is what we built. This is the construction. It was 400 meters long. Initially, it was going to be a kilometer long. And then they reduced it to 400 meters, half a kilometer, like four blocks. And a huge mountain of sand was piled up like that all the way and then covered with concrete and steel all the way. So thick, five meters in the thinnest part, that no bomb of the Second World War could go through that. And this is what the construction was. It was giant. Here is a soldier walking. You see how the size of it compared to the building? Here's another man. A giant construction. Here's another picture of the construction. Huge, huge, huge. And here's a board. On those boards, our prisoners had to stand on those narrow boards. And in winter, they were wet and frozen and slippery. And they had to hold a pipe which was coming down from a crane, feeding ready mixed concrete into the casting. And they had to spread it around and, and spread the concrete. And when the wind blew the pipe, it was a heavy steel pipe, sideways, Sometimes a prisoner fell off the board and into the concrete, and he drowned in the concrete. One of my very good friends, one day didn't come back from work, I said, where is my friend, where is Michael? They said, he's in the concrete. He's in the concrete. Many fell in. I went back to Germany two years ago. It was 65 years after liberation, and they had a special event, and they invited me, and they gave me two tickets, and I took my grandson, who is exactly 17. I had my 17th birthday there. My father tried to give me a piece of his bread, and I wouldn't take it. Yeah. I used to lie and dream every night about food, about my mother making the Napoleon cake which was my beloved cake. Now my wife makes it. Tomorrow is my 85th birthday, and my wife has just made yesterday the cake. Yeah. I went back to Germany, and I said, I want to go in there. And they said, you can't. It's a military compound. I said, get me in there. So they found a colonel of the German Air Force, who have their whole control, their communication center for the whole of Germany is inside that thing. It was never finished, but the front part was finished. And he took me in there, and he knew the whole history. 
And I said, take me to the wall. I want to touch the wall from inside. And here I am. This is a wall inside. I said, I have my friend inside buried. He said, not only your friend. There were many. It was a very moving moment. We stayed in that camp for 10 months, and they gave us nothing to eat. Hunger is a very painful experience. It, it makes you think of nothing else. When you walk to work and the core of an apple is on the ground, 10 men jump to get it. Um, it's something that you think of nothing else except eat, how to eat, something to eat. And we became very thin. First we lost our fat, then we lost our muscles. Eventually, I used to close my hands around my waist and they used to close. My fingers used to come together. I weighed less than 70 pounds when I was liberated. I was 17 years old, I was six foot tall. My father weighed even less, 65. And finally we knew we were dying. Everybody was dying, everybody was dying, one after the other. I carried hundreds of dead bodies to the big mass pit, which I now visited, the grave. A third of our camp was dead after 10 months. But at the end, we knew that the American army was very close, that the Germans lost the war. What will happen to us, the few survivors who were barely living? I got a very good job, actually. I got a job as a mechanic at a pump indoors. And I got my father to work in there, and that saved his life. We worked indoors. I was pumping the ready-mixed concrete all the way to the building site. So I have a huge pump in charge and a very nice German Meister who was very kind to me, gave me extra food. It was wonderful, a nice, good German man. And then they stopped the construction and they put us on a train and they took us to Central Camp Dachau, the granddaddy of all concentration camps. This is what it looked like. Those were proper barracks, you see. And there were 39 of them, and each one held a 1,000 people, so it had to hold 40,000 people. There were 65,000 people there, and half of them were dying, and some of them were dead, lying all over in the street. They didn't have time fast enough to pick up the bodies, because people were brought from all over. It was crowded. And my father was dying. My father was at the end. I knew. I had seen the sign. I had seen how people die. He had swollen legs. He couldn't walk. His eyes were not focused. And he was just at the end. The reason we both survived is because each one knew that if the, the other one would suffer if you gave up. Because I was one time, I was very sick. I had uh, fleck fever and spotted typhus, xanthemic typhus. It's a, it's a viral disease that knocks you out with huge temperature for three days. You are unconscious. And then either you wake up or you wake up dead. <laughs> yeah, I woke up. And uh, long and short, we got into the camp. And my father, I knew, maybe another day, maybe two maximum, he will not live. We will be liberated or we will be killed. One commandant told us, you think you will be surviving the war? Forget it, we are keeping the last bullet for you. Don't worry about it. You are not going to be free. Yeah, we saw him hanged because he had a court case and he was hanged after the war, was a vicious man, vicious man. He could kill a man with his boots and showed us how. Long and short, my father got into the barracks. There's no place. The four levels of bunks are full of people dying and barely living. But they pulled out the dead body, so he grabbed the spot. He climbed in there and he wouldn't come out. I couldn't get him out of there. I wanted him to stand, to move, to not to die. But I knew it was no good. He is not going to make it. And when they brought the food, in the afternoon, he couldn't get up to stand in line to get it. So he gave me his dish. All we owned was a dish and a spoon. That's all. That was our total possession. And he told me to get the soup for him. So I didn't, wasn't sure I would get it. But when I stood in line, I said, this is for him. He gave me a soup and a, and a piece of bread. I took it to him. And when he picked up the soup, at that moment, there was a noise outside. And people were screaming. The Americans are here. We are free. I said, Father, it's over. The war is over for us. We are free. Oh, he said, that's good. Have you got a bread? That was my moment of liberation. Have you got a bread? You see, 
These are the crematoria where they used to burn the bodies. They had many of them. I just took a picture of a few of them that are still standing there. And this is a crowd of, Ameri of uh, uh, prisoners came out to greet the Americans, when those who could walk, those who could stand. Many of them res remained in their bunks. They couldn't move. Many people died after. Thank you very much. That's my story. Up to you, I'll answer questions, if I can. Yes? I'm sorry? Did you ever see your little cousin again? Yes, I did. Yeah, did you see her often? Here she is, after the war. She came back to Germany, her mother, who survived the war, and my mother, who survived the war. But her, her mother went back to Germany, found a girl, and brought her to us. She only spoke Lithuanian now. We had to teach her Yiddish all over again. And uh, she's a lovely woman. She lives in Norway. And uh, I see her often. And sometimes she comes here. But when she sits here, I can't tell her story. I cry. That's the only thing that makes me totally cry and break down. I, I, I love this woman. And we are such good friends. And that's her. So she survived. Any more questions? No, I don't have a tattoo, because in our camp, we didn't tattoo the arm. They gave us a number on our jackets. We had a jacket. One day, somebody stole a jacket from somebody else, and the guy died. And they thought that our friend died, but it turned out, no, no, he says, they just stole my jacket. <laughs> oh, we were just a number. 81,520 was my number. 21 was my father's number. Would you like to know what it is? What made me keep going? I'll tell you, I'm a Jew, and I knew the Jewish history. To me, this was just another event in a long Jewish history of persecution since we lost our temple in the year zero, you know, in the year 30, um, when Jesus was born. And the temple was actually destroyed when in 2000, uh, in zero eight, I think. I am not sure. But we had been persecuted around the world once we were dispersed by Rome into Europe. And there were all kinds of attacks on our people, and we survived. So I thought, this is another survival. We are going through a historical process. Perhaps I won't make it, but the Jews will survive somehow. And Hitler is not going to have a thousand-year Reich, a thousand-year state as he promised them. Nothing of the kind. We knew that such evil could not survive. So I had that belief that this evil is not going to survive. Perhaps I will, perhaps I won't. I have a question about when you were living in the ghetto and uh, you had all of your books. What, made, what motivated you to keep reading instead of keeping busy a different way? I just loved reading. I loved reading since I was a kid. You know, long after the war, one day I said to my father, because my father survived, I thought he would die even after liberation. But two hours later, he came out of the bunk, he stood there, and he said, so now what? <laughs> he survived. We went into a hospital for six months. I'll tell you in a moment how I got my education and so on. Um, he survived. And three months after the end of the war, we found my mother. And uh, what made me read? I said to my father one day, Father, you know, I want to thank you. You have given me a love of books, and it has remained with me my whole life, and I thank you for it. And do you know, my father was so happy to hear it, that when he died, shortly before he died, a few weeks before he died at 84, I've now outlived my father, he said to me, you once told me that you thanked me for giving you the love of books. And I must tell you, it made me happy all my life to think of that, say, what you said. So children, if you have a chance to tell your parents while they are alive that you are grateful for something, it's a wonderful thing to do. It's a very nice thing to do for parents because you know they suffer enough bringing us up and all the trouble we give them. 
So sometimes we should give them a little recognition. Remember that. It's a nice thing to do. My parents survived. And here's my mother. Perhaps we switch off the lights for a little bit. Oh, leave it on, leave it on. You can see it. This is my mother. After, soon after, she was a very beautiful woman, but here she looks very thin and kind of... And this is my father. A little while after liberation, when he came back from hospital and so on. And uh, I, we were now in Germany. We were in a camp, a displaced persons camp. And we hated it. We wanted to get out of Germany. We didn't want to be in Germany. But for two years, we stayed in Germany because no country wanted us. Nobody wanted us. Canada was totally locked up. They agreed to take 500 orphans, finally. And then they took a 1,000. Only much later did they open the gates. America was closed. Palestine was locked up by the British. It wasn't yet Israel. When there were 120,000 refugees, Jewish refugees, sitting in Germany. No country wanted them. Sweden took a couple, and Norway took some. And in fact, we went to Norway. After two years, my parents got tired of waiting. We had relatives in South Africa. They wouldn't take Jews or Catholics. We were in good company there. <laughs> we wanted to get out. But I, I wasn't thinking about anything. I wanted an education. I wanted to be an engineer. How can I do it? I haven't been to high school. So I started to study mathematics and physics and chemistry, and it was hard. So I started to sell my... And my cigarettes and my coffee and my chocolate. Now, cigarettes and coffee I didn't need, but chocolate, I love chocolate. But I sold it in the black market, I got money, and I paid German professors to give me private lessons. And I also took a course in radio mechanics. I became a radio repairman after a 10 month course. And then I presented myself at the University of Munich and they had a special commission for people like us who didn't have documents or papers for education to see what we know. And for half an hour, five professors grilled me in everything from mathematics all the way through higher maths and calculus and everything else, and through physics all the way right up to, to the very top of the course. And they gave me permission to join the university to come as a student at the technical high school in Germany for engineering. Electrical engineer. Now I wanted to be a radio uh, engineer, electronics engineer. Before I was thinking of a mechanical engineer, but now I wanted radio because I was fascinated by electronics. And when I came home and told my parents, hey, I'm into university, they've accepted me. They said, you are not going. Why not? Because we are going to Norway. Norway? What's Norway? Well, nobody wants us. We can't go anywhere. Norway is offered to take 900 Jews. Not too many people want to go there. They are scared of being too close to Russia and of the cold winters. We are going. We got up, the whole family, my three uncles survived, my aunt, my little girl, my parents and I. And we all went to Norway. And they were very good to us. They were wonderful to us. They greeted us and they... They gave us housing, they gave us pocket money, they gave us toothbrushes and bed sheets. They were just fantastic. Taught us Norwegian. They had a class for Norwegian, and students came to teach. Well, I sat there in the class, and I could see it's going very slowly. I mean, those older people, they couldn't take it all in so quickly. So, <laughs> so I took the student aside, I said, what are you doing after the class? He said, nothing, I'm on holiday here. It was a nice, beautiful place by a fjord, a gorgeous place. Uh, I said, yeah, come and talk to me <laughs> and get me a newspaper every day. And I started to teach myself Norwegian. And in three months, I could speak Norwegian because, you know, if you know four or five languages, the sixth one is very easy. <laughs> yeah. So I learned Norwegian in three months enough to speak. I went into the city, capital city. I got a job as a mechanic in a radio shop right away. And I turned out that I was trained well so I could fix radios, car radios I was fixing. And the guy appreciated me very much and it was good. At night, I went to night school. I want to be an engineer. So I went to night school to get Norwegian matric because what they accepted in Germany wasn't accepted here. Well, that was a hard job, so my father writes to an uncle in Johannesburg, South Africa, 
and says, send some money so my son could study full time. Didn't have to work. And uncle says, I can't send out money. We are not allowed. Come to Africa and I will make sure your son can go to university. Well, that was enough for my parents. My father's brother lived in Zimbabwe. It was called Rhodesia at the time. It was a British colony. So he finally, after two and a half years, three years, he managed to make us pay us. So three years after liberation, we left Norway and we went all the way to Africa, from the cold to the heat. <laughs> and we arrived in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia. And now, now I had to learn English. I didn't know a word. How long would it take you to learn English? Another language. Three, four years. 30, 40 years? Three, four years, maybe. Three, four years. Okay. Possible, yeah. Yeah, that's what my parents took about three, four years. I did this in nine months. Guys, I sweated it through. I asked, I had a teacher for two weeks before the school started, the school year. And I said, get me into grade 12. Get me into grade he says, I don't think I can do it. They won't take you because you don't speak. I said, get me into grade 12. I'll learn it. So he went to the headmaster with me, and I was standing there like an adult. I didn't know what they were saying to each other. And the headmaster looked at me, <laughs> very doubtful, and he said uh, something like, uh, do you understand what we are saying here? I said, a little. <laughs> I don't know what you are saying. <laughs> well, he says, we'll give him a try, but we don't promise him. I said, I don't need promises, just let me in. They let me into grade 12, and I wrote three essays a week besides the schoolwork, and my teacher used to mark it with a red pencil. I came to hate the red pencil, but I copied everything again, so I learned how to write a good English sentence, a correct English sentence. If I can write a good sentence, I can write the exam. I couldn't speak very well. I'll just tell you one funny thing. In the school, yes. Sorry, I just have a question for you. It's, it's just a bit of a segue interrupting your story. Go ahead. Sorry. At the time that you were liberated, there's not only the physical uh, being put in a hospital and getting yourself back in. Psychologically, how did you, after liberation, you look at Germans, at what they did to you, and how did you put it all back together mentally that not all of them were bad, I mean, how, how did that... You're asking a very fundamental question, you know, because the day before yesterday I was at, at Western University speaking to oh 170 my. graduate students and master's degree and so on, and I started by telling them what happened to us after the war because I have 20 letters that I found now after a long story of my parents, which I just found this year. But they write, let us out of this bloody earth. We want to leave this earth. It was a big shock. We wanted to get out of there. And I spoke about the Today, when a soldier comes back from Afghanistan, they have got immediately a person to discuss whether he has got any, uh, what do they call it, the stress disorder. It is. stress disorder. Nobody asked us how we felt. They gave us food, they gave us clothing, they gave us a house to live, a place to live. But nobody asked the survivor, how do you feel? Nobody did at that time. And we were disturbed. And there were 120,000 of us, and we were all sitting in camps in Germany. And until Israel was created, 100,000 went to Israel. There was no country wanted us. But we got out to Norway. And it was a shock. Now, there's another question. How do you feel about Germans, I think, is implied in your question. At the time. At the time, yes. When I came out of Germany, I hated Germans. I was thinking my head was full with sorts of murder, sorts of, of revenge. I, every German I saw, I suspected of, of the right age of being a murderer. And after a while, I said to myself, what are you doing? You spend your time and your brain power to think about them instead of about yourself. This is crazy. Anyway, not every German is guilty. Only a few did the terrible things. The rest of them are either bystanders or they didn't even know what's going on. I said, this was a dictatorship. They all had to do what they do. Stop hating. Hate is a useless, disturbing feeling. And I gave it up. 
I don't hate Germans now. I meet Germans, I have German friends. So that tells you, I don't. You can't hate anybody. I'll speak in another moment about that. Anyway, I went, I got my matric in Rhodesia, and I went to Johannesburg University because we didn't have one in Rhodesia. And uh, four years later, I graduated as an electronics engineer. I came back to, to, to Bulawayo, where my parents lived, and I started to have an interesting time. I went fishing. I loved Africa. This is a tiger fish. It's got teeth that can cut your finger in a second. I went crocodile hunting. This is a crocodile I shot. I mean, I, did, I went mountain climbing. I wanted to learn to fly, but my mother wouldn't let me. You survive Dachau and you want to fly? You're crazy. Don't think of it. I'm going to die if you do it. She found once my application for a medical thing to go to fly. Oh, uh, she wouldn't let me have a motorbike. I was dying for a motorbike. So I did all these. My mother didn't know about it. I never told her. This is on the Zambezi River. Fantastic river. Incredible places. And then I had other dreams. I wanted to find a woman I could love all my life. That's hard to find, you know, it's a lot of hard work. I had a good time looking, mind you. <laughs> yeah. But I find her. Aww. Hey, this is my wife. We've been married for 55 years. Next week is our anniversary, 55. <laughs> I'm telling you that because I want you to know it is possible to love the same person for 55 years. We are still in love. We are deeply in love. We have a wonderful life together. So here we are. And I learned to fly because we had three children very quickly. I don't know how it happened. And, <laughs> and I had three children in South Africa. And I was working and everything was good. And we had a nice company that are going uh, with our family. And I said, Esme, we must get out of here. Those kids are growing up racist because my three-year-old started to boss around the, the gardener, a man of 30. And he used to call him the little bus. He was a charge. Thank you. Another printer said, okay, I'm finishing in three minutes. I want you to know we got to Canada and I learned to fly. I became a pilot. I had my own airplane and I learned to glide. Gliding is a wonderful poetry of flight. It's the nicest thing you can do. And now I just want to tell you, why do I come to talk to you? Because I want you to understand that to have genocide, you need three things. You need personal prejudice against other people. We are born with a personal prejudice against people who are different to ourselves. You've got to cut it out. You know nothing about other people until you know them personally. This kind of hatred and dislike and stories like about Newf in Newfoundland, we tell jokes about Newfies. It's not nice. Don't do it. Be aware that you cannot know anything about another person of a race or creed or religion until you meet them personally. You've got to give it up. But that alone is not enough for genocide. For genocide, you also need a government that supports the killing by bringing you weapons. In Rwanda, they distributed machetes. In Germany, machine guns. The result is the same. You kill. And you need a political leader who says, it's OK to kill. Go and do it. And that's what happens. This is an elder of the First Nations speaking to his grandson. And he says, within each one of us, there are two wolves the wolf of love and friendship, and the wolf of hatred and bitterness. And the grandson says, which wolf will win? Because these two wolves are fighting with each other, the grandfather said. He said, which wolf will win? The one you feed. Don't feed the bad wolf. Thank you very much. <laughs>